Thank you for your interest in our class, our study of God's prophetic word. This is the second in the series. We are going to be looking at prophecies against Assyria today. This is the first uh, in the actual investigation of different civilizations. Last week, we had an introduction to the concept of prophecy and an example from uh, the book of Amos. Now, civilization, a term that we use quite often to describe a certain group of people, uh, really is defined by a community characterized by the division of labor and interdependent relationships. That is, different people do different things, contribute to society that way. They, they do it faster and better than if they had to do everything. And people are dependent upon one another. And this makes possible civilizations, particularly by making possible time. Time is a precious commodity, and it gives the opportunity for the development of the characteristics of a civilization, such as in a writing, building, ar architecture and construction, science of various kinds, uh, nations, political uh, development, uh, and all kinds of various characteristics of a civilization, and so progress can be made. Now, I think there's agreement among scholars, scientists and historians alike, that the first civilization was Sumer in Mesopotamia, dating sometime between 4500 BC and 3200 BC. So a good round figure is 3500 BC. And then after a period of time, about 500 years, we're going to see the development of three more civilizations, China, Egypt, and India. Of these three, actually of the four, the only one in which we find a continuous, uninterrupted civilization would be China. Egypt, ancient Egypt came to an end with the invasion of the Macedonians, and then the Romans, and Egypt became the province of the emperor, the original Indian civilization came to an end. That civilization was centered around two cities, Mohenjo-daro and Harappa. And then we find the Aryan uh, people coming in. They made a tremendous contribution, but that was not the original. Now, if we go back to Mesopotamian civilizations, the Fertile Crescent, that area that we find uh, uh, Middle Eastern countries today like uh, Iran and Iraq, and uh, uh, Syria, these civilizations, we'll find the first being Sumer, 3500 to 1900. The next was Akkadia. The Akkadians came in and they overpowered Sumer by 1900. They will be in power until about 2270 BC, at which time the Amorites will establish themselves at a city Babylon, which they will build up, make that their capital. And so this is the first Babylonian empire. Uh, it will pick up where the Akkadians left off and uh, they are continue down to about 1600 BC. Then as the fall of the Babylonian civilization, we're going to see three smaller groups that will dominate parts, but not all of the Fertile Crescent region, the Mesopotamian region, the Kasites, the Huronians, and the Mitanni. And then the development of Assyria. That's the civilization we'll focus on today. They came into the area around 1300 and, uh, uh, and established a tremendous empire. And this will be the first Mesopotamian civilization with which Israel could have interacted. They did interact with certain groups, certain cities uh, prior to this, but as far as a big empire is concerned, uh, a powerful nation, it will be Assyria. And Assyria fell to the Neo-Babylonians in 606. And that's the empire ruled by Nebuchadnezzar. And of course, Israel had much to do with Nebuchadnezzar. That empire continued until 539 when they were overthrown by the Persians. Now, 
we do read about some of the early civilizations in Genesis 10, because after the flood and the earth was repopulated by Shem, Ham, and Japheth, uh, we're going to find such uh, cities as Babylon, uh, Akkad, and Nineveh. Babylon, of course, is the capital of the Babylonian Empire, and that city has been excavated and is known today. Uh, you see also listed there Erek, which was in Sumer. Akkad, the capital of the Akkadians, has never to this day been found. We know that it existed here in the Bible is a record of it. We know there were Akkadians. They had a capital city, but where it is, we do not know. And then Nineveh. We'll talk about Nineveh today in our study. So the Assyrians, they were a tough race of mountaineers from north of the Sumer region. They expanded from their capital city at Nineveh around 1300, established the first organized government around 1100, and the first dynasty around 900. Their art shows tremendous energy and vigor and a total devotion to war. They were a warlike people. They built their whole civilization on fresh conquests, destroying nations, taking the booty, taking the loot uh, from them and living off that until another uh, people is conquered. They were ruled by an aristocratic minority and always based on fresh conquests. And they were able to conquer through a policy of calculated terror, terror tactics. They developed a brutal police state. And their uh, methodology included what we might call psychological warfare. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Now, the first king will be Ashurnazepal, the founder of the dynasty. He said he was commanded by the god Asher. Thus, Asher appears in his name. He created a virtual military machine, and that becomes the basis and the operation of the Assyrian Empire. He is one of the first to record his brutal accomplishments in annals written every year. And they wrote this brutal history on stone pillars to impress people with the strength. Uh, so Ashurnasipal ruled between 885 and 858 in the ninth century. Here we see relief sculpture of Ashurnasipal. And he was followed by Shalmaneser III. He died in 825. Tiglath-Pileser III, otherwise known as Pul in the Bible, 745 to 727. It is Tiglath-Pileser who really created the Assyrian Empire. He captured the city of Babylon, which had been the capital of the original Babylonian Empire. He called himself the great king, the ruler of the world, and he controlled in all directions. Sargon II, next great king, 722 to 705, captured Samaria, and by Samaria I mean Israel, the ten northern tribes, captured them and took them into captivity. Uh, it is thought 27,000, maybe more, Hebrews, they never returned. They become the ten lost tribes of Israel. So on the left, you see Shalmaneser III, a uh, relief sculpture of him. On the right, you see Tiglath-Pileser III, and underneath, Sargon II. And here is a map showing the extent of the Assyrian Empire, going down into Egypt, uh, going around the, to the Persian Gulf, controlling the area that used to be Sumer. Uh, that's where you see Ur. Uh, you see Susa, which is the capital, became the capital of Persia. And uh, then if you come around to the Mediterranean, you see Tarsus, where the Apostle Paul came from, and that would be in Anatolia. So it's a huge empire. We want to really focus on Sennacherib, who ruled between 704 and 681, one of the most remarkable examples of God's prophecy coming true. Sennacherib destroyed 89 towns and 820 villages, and he carried 208,000 people into captivity during his brutal reign. He slaughtered the entire population of Babylon in 689. But he failed to capture Jerusalem 
at the time of King Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah. And he was focused on capturing Jerusalem. It was his intention, his plan, very carefully devised plan to do it. He had never failed before, but he fails with Jerusalem. We'll see that. Here's Sennacherib and a relief sculpture of him. Now, the threat of the invincible Assyria fell hard upon Israel. And we read from Isaiah, the 36th chapter, and I will say there were two accounts. They are parallel accounts. They are consistent with each other. Uh, very little difference told from a little different standpoint. I'm not going to read all of the material from both of these accounts. We'll primarily follow Isaiah. The other one's in Second Chronicles. Isaiah 36. In the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. And the king of Assyria sent the Rabshake from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem with a great army. And he stood by the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field. And there came out to him Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, and Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder. And the Rabshaka said to them, Say to Hezekiah, Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, On what do you rest this trust of yours? Do you think that mere words are strategy and power for war? In whom do you now trust that you have rebelled against me? Behold, you are trusting in Egypt, that broken reed of a staff, which will pierce the hand of any man who leans on it. Such is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who trust in him. But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and altars Hezekiah has removed? saying to Judah and to Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar. Come now, make a wager with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you are able on your part to set riders on them. How then can you repulse a single captain among the least of my master's servants when you trust in Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? Behold, is it without... The Lord, that I have come up to, against this land to destroy it, the Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. Obviously, many misrepresentations in this message to the king of Judah. Now, Sennacherib made a fatal error. You can see it reflected in the words of the Reb Shaka that we just read, and we'll look, look now as the Second Chronicles account. And his servants, that is Sennacherib's servants, said, still more against the Lord God and against his servant Hezekiah. And he wrote letters to cast contempt on the Lord, the God of Israel, and to speak against him, saying, Like the gods of the nations of the lands who have not delivered their people from my hands, so the God of Hezekiah will not deliver his people from my hand. And they shouted it with a loud voice in the language of Judah to the people of Jerusalem who were on the wall to frighten and terrify them, in order that they might take the city. And they spoke of the God of Jerusalem as they spoke of the gods of the peoples of the earth, which are the work of men's hands. That's the fatal error of Sennacherib. He equated the God of Jerusalem, the true God, with the idols and false gods. Now, the strategy was interesting. It was successful. Uh, it, it was a, a very, very brutal, uh, dramatic strategy in the account in Isaiah. It starts with intimidation of the masses. Uh, it, it is the psychological warfare. Then Eliakim, Shebna, and Joah, these are the uh, said to Reb Shaika, please speak to your servants in Aramaic. For we understand it. Do not speak to us in the language of Judah, that is in Hebrew, within the hearing of the people who are on the wall. But the Rabshakeh said, Has my master sent me to speak these words to your master and to you, and not to the men sitting on the wall who are doomed with you to eat their own dung and drink their own urine? That would be, of course, 
attempt to frighten them. Second point in the strategy, undermine and discredit the opposition. Again, quoting from Isaiah. Then the Rabshakeh stood and called out in a loud voice in the language of Judah, hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you. Do not let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord by saying, the Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah. Third strategy point. Win the confidence of the masses. Seduce them with false promises. For thus says the king of Assyria, make your peace with me and come out to me. Then each one of you will eat his own of his own vine and each one of, of his own fig tree. And each one of you will drink the water of his own cistern. Until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, land of grain and wine, a land of bread and vineyards. Obviously talking about the deportation. And fourth, undermine the people's hope in divine deliverance and convince them that Sennacherib is absolutely invincible. Beware, lest Hezekiah mislead you by saying, the Lord will deliver us. Has any of the gods of the nations delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the guard, gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Zepharphim? Where Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who among all the gods of these lands have delivered their lands out of my hand that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? Very clever strategy. Well, what was Hezekiah's response to this threat from the Rabshakeh, the representative of Sennacherib? Well, the Jews were silent and answered him not a word, for the king's command was, do not answer him. Then Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, and Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, came to Hezekiah with their clothes torn and told him the words of the Rabshakeh. As soon as King Hezekiah heard it, he tore his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. And he sent Eliakim, who was over the household, and Shebna, the secretary, and the senior priest, covered with sackcloth, to the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, they said to him, thus says Hezekiah, this is a day of distress, of rebuke and of disgrace. Children have come to the point of birth and there's no strength to bring them forth. It may be that the Lord your God will hear the words of the Rabshakeh, whom his master, the king of Assyria has sent to mock the living God and will rebuke the words that the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, Lift up your prayer for the remnant that is left. <clears throat> and then Sennacherib responded. When the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, Isaiah said to them, say to your master, thus says the Lord, do not be afraid because of the words that you've heard with which the young men of the king of Assyria have reviled me. Behold, I will put a spirit in him so that he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land and I will make him fall by the sword in his own land. He, that is Sennacherib, then sent messengers to Hezekiah, saying, Thus shall you speak to Hezekiah, the king of Judah. Do not let your God, in whom you trust, deceive you by promising that J Jerusalem will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, you have heard what the king of Assyria has done to all lands, devoting them to destruction. And shall you be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered them, the nations that my fathers destroyed? Well, then Hezekiah reacts to this announcement from Sennacherib. He received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you are alone of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. And hear all the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly, O Lord, 
the kings of Assyria have laid waste all the nations and their lands and have cast their gods into the fire. For they were no gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore, they were all destroyed. So now, O Lord, our God, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are the Lord. And now the response of God himself. Hezekiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hez Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, because you have prayed to me concerning Sennacherib, king of Assyria, this is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning him. And this shall be the sign for you. This year you shall eat what grows of itself, and in the second year what springs from that, and the third year sow and reap and plant vineyards and eat their fruit. And the surviving remnant of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go a remnant, and out of Mount Zion a band of survivors. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city or shoot an arrow there or come before it with a shield or cast up a siege mound against it. By the way that he came, by that same he shall return. And he shall not come into this city, declares the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. And the angel of the Lord went and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when people arose early in the morning, behold, these were all dead bodies. Then Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, departed and returned home and lived at Nineveh. And as he was worshiping in the house of Nisroch, his god, Adramelech and Sherezer, his son, struck him down with a sword. And after they escaped into the land of Ararat, he had his son reigned in his place. The account in Second Chronicles is interesting of the de deliverance of Jerusalem. Hezekiah the king and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, prayed because of this and cried to heaven. And the Lord sent an angel who cut off all the mighty warriors and commanders and officers of the camp of the king of Assyria. So he returned with shame of face to his own land. And when he came into the house of his God, some of his own sons struck him down there with a sword. So the Lord saved Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib, king of Assyria, and from the hand of all his enemies. And he provided for them on every side. And many brought gifts to the Lord to Jerusalem and precious things to Hezekiah, king of Judah, so that he was exalted in the sight of all nations from that time onward. And how do we know that it happened just as described by Isaiah in his prophecy and in the book of Second Chronicles? Well, that has been proven by archaeology, a very definite proof, a marvelous and interesting proof. And that is on the Taylor cylinder or the Taylor prism. On this six-sided uh, object, as you see here in the picture, Sennacherib lists his campaigns and boasts about his might. In all his descriptions, his preparations, and then his results of his conquest, in regard to Hezekiah, king of Judah, he describes the mighty and elaborate plan for the destruction of Jerusalem, including laying siege to the city and shutting up Hezekiah in it like a bird in its cage. But then nothing of the conquest. There are several other nations listed on this prism. On one side, he will describe his laying siege to the city, on the opposite side, he describes how the city fell, laid siege, city falls, laid siege, city falls. In the regard to Jerusalem, he laid siege, and then nothing. Now, this is the text from column three, so you can see how the siege is described. As for Hezekiah the Judahite, who did not submit to my yoke, 46 of his strong walled cities, as well as the small towns in that area, which were without number, by leveling with battering rams and by bringing up siege engines and by attacking and storming on foot, by mines, tunnels, and breaches, I besieged and took them. 200,150 people, great and small, male and female, horses, mules, asses, camels, cattle, and sheep without number. I brought them away with them. 
I counted them as spoil. Hezekiah himself, like a caged bird, I shut up in Jerusalem, his royal city. I threw up earthworks against him. The one coming out of the city gate, I turned back to his misery. His cities, which I had despoiled, I cut off from his land. And to Metini, king of Ashdod, Padi, king of Ekron, and Silibel, king of Gaza, I gave them. And thus I diminished his land. I added to the former tribute. And I laid upon him the surrender of their land and impulse, gifts of, for my majesty. As for Hezekiah, the terrifying splendor of my majesty overcame him. And the Arabs and his mercenary troops, which he had brought in to strengthen Jerusalem, his royal city, deserted him. In addition to the 30 talents of gold and 800 talents of silver, gems, antimony, jewels, large carnelians, ivory inlaid couches, ivory inlaid chairs, elephant hides, elephant tusks, ebony, boxwood, all kinds of valuable treasures, as well as his daughters, his harem, his male and female musicians, which he had brought after me to Nineveh, my royal city, to pay tribute and to accept servitude, he dispatched his messengers. Those are the words of, Neve of uh, Sennacherib on the Taylor Cylinder. But nothing zero silence that silence is very revealing he didn't take the city it was followed by ashurbanipal who ruled 668 to 631 the last great king and he was a great scholar he had a huge library thousands of tablets and all of them were found by sir austin henry layard in 1829 Thus, Layard proved, contrary to skeptics' assertion, that there was no Nineveh. It was only a biblical myth because it was not mentioned anywhere outside the Bible and no one could find Nineveh. And so there was a doubt that even Nineveh existed. It was Layard who disproved that. And, of course, that confirmed the biblical account. Ashurbanipal. Here's the relief sculpture of Ashurbanipal, the last great king of Assyria. Here we see Ashurbanipal killing a lion. This is another uh, relief sculpture in the British Museum. And the library of Ashurbanipal points out the tremendous advance in learning among the Assyrians. Great advances in literature, impressive art, as you see in these relief sculptures. Yet, and here's the cultural contradiction, unspeakable cruelty to their adversaries and the effective use of intimidation techniques and psychological warfare. This is a concept of Ashurbanipal's palace in Nineveh. It was indeed a fortified city had an inner wall 100 feet tall, the height of a 10-story building, 50 feet thick, six or seven cars could be parked abreast, three chariots abreast. The towers were 200 feet tall, that's the height of a 20-story building. There were 15 gates, two outer walls separated by two deep ditches, 2,007 feet distance from the inside of the inner wall to the inside of the outer wall. The whole fortifications were about 2,200 feet or about half a mile, there's a 150 foot wide moat, seven mile circumference, a tremendously strong fortified city. And yet it fell. Now let's look at a few additional, very specific prophecies and their fulfillment. I think the most spectacular, of course, is the salvation of Jerusalem, the fact that Sennacherib did not take it in spite of his determined plan and to do so. But we also read in Nahum, chapter 1, verse 10, that the Ninevites would be drunk in their final hours just before the fall of the city of Nineveh. The prophecy reads, for they are like entangled thorns, like drunkards as they drink. They are consumed like stubble fully dried. In fulfillment, the comment by Bernard Ram states that a part of the success of the Medes, who were a part of the the conquering army, <clears throat> was due to the optimism of the Ninevites who assumed the enemy was permanently repulsed 
and gave themselves to drinking and feasting. And then the prophecy is that the Ninevites would be totally wiped out. Nahum chapter 1 verse 14. The Lord has given commandment about you. No more shall your name be perpetuated. From the house of your gods, I will cut off the carved image and the metal image. I will make your grave, for you are vile. For the fulfillment, we look to George Meisinger, who speaks to the critics that jeered even the prior existence of Nineveh, saying the priceless records of this once dauntless empire have been withheld from the annals of world history until the 19th century. Sir Henry Layard, that indefatigable English pioneer archaeologist, was the first to unlock the mysteries of this nation, a nation which had refused to yield her secrets to mankind for so long. Yet, almost from the first turn of Layard's spade, the city began to surrender hundreds and then thousands of informative clues to the past. For centuries, the only knowledge that such an empire existed was to be found in the direct and indirect statements of scripture. As the centuries rolled by, and as no archaeological evidence turned up to substantiate the biblical record, doubt began to grow as to whether such a people ever existed. The historian puzzled. The skeptic jeered the scriptural accounts. So complete was Assyria's extinction. Also, Nahum prophesied that Nineveh would be hit by the flood. Prophecy, the river gates are open, the palace melts away. Fulfillment. Nahum 2.6 contains a remarkably exact prediction. For subsequent history reveals that a vital part of the city walls of Nineveh was carried away by a great flood. And this ruin of the defensive system permitted the besieging Medes and Chaldeans, that's Babylonians, to storm the city without difficulty. And then in chapter 3, verse 12, the prophecy that Nineveh's fortresses would be easily captured. All your fortresses are like fig trees with first ripe figs. If shaken, they fall into the mouth of the eater. In fulfillment, we see the inhabitants had great amounts of food stored away. And as a result, the city retained, remained a resistance to the attackers for three years. But after three years, in heavy rains, the river swelling wide, broke down a distance of the city walls and flooded a portion of the city. The king panicked, believing that the aforementioned prophecy had been completed. He gave up hope and ordered his kingly possessions, as well as concubines and so forth, into a portion of his palace and sealing off that palace, burned the whole thing down. The seizures, learning of the break in the wall, attacked this point, forcing entry into the city and took over as victors of the whole city. And after the time of Ashurbanipal, the empire disintegrated and fell to the Neo-Babylonian Empire in 612. The city itself was taken in 612. There was a final battle at Carchemish in which the Babylonian army uh, defeated the Assyrians. And the city, of course, held out for a little while until a three-month siege gave way. Also, Nahum prophesied that the city would be destroyed by fire. There will be the fire devour you. The sword will cut you off. It will devour you like the locust. Multiply yourselves like the locust. Multiply like the grasshopper. In fulfillment, the comment by M.E.L. Malawan vividly records the destruction of Assyria. We found the throne room at Fort Shalmaneser was a dramatic illustration of the final sack. The wall plaster has been packed hard and burnt yellow by the flames and then blackened with soot, which had penetrated into the brickwork itself. The intense heat had caused the south wall to bend inward at a dangerous angle, and the floor of the chamber itself was buried under a great pile of burnt debris over a meter and a half in depth, filled with ash, charcoal, small antiquities, there were also many hundreds of mutilated fragments of ivory carverings, burnt black and gray, sometimes to a high polish from the heat. This debris was mixed with inflammable cereals, which consisted of millet and barley, wheat and ember. I have in my time witnessed the debris of many an ancient fire, 
but never have I seen so perfect an example of a vengeful bonfire, loose packed as bonfires are, the suit still permeating the air as we approached. After this great holocaust, parts of the walls toppled over into the chamber, which was filled to a total height of three meters in all with mud brick. The hard upper packing amounting to another meter and a half of debris over that of the bonfire thus finally sealed the contents, which were left undisturbed until we reached them in 1958. And then Nahum prophesied that Nineveh's army officers would desert. Prophecy reads, your princes are like grasshoppers, your scribes like clouds of locusts sitting on the fences in a day of cold. When the sun rises, they fly away. No one knows where they are. The fulfillment is seen in a paraphrase from Diodorus of Sicily, the historian, uh, 26 to 27 AD. He camped, says, camped outside the city walls, the king of Assyria, who had been unaware of his deteriorating position militarily and overaware of his victories against the enemy, became lax in his vigilance and began to indulge with his soldiers in a feast of animals and much wine and drinking. This fact of decline in the Assyrians' defenses reached the enemy general Arbasis through deserters, and a night attack was pursued. With great success, Arbasis organized troops, routed the disorganized camp of the Assyrians, and sent them back in flight to their city with great losses. And Zephaniah prophesied that Nineveh, the seat of power for the Assyrian Empire, would become desolate. Zephaniah 2.13 he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria. He will make Nineveh a desolation, a dry waste like the desert. Herds shall lie down in her midst. All kinds of beasts, even the owl and the hedgehog, shall lodge in her capitals. A voice shall hoot in the hollow. Devastation will be on the threshold, for her cedar work will be laid bare. This is the exultant city that lives securely and said in her heart, I am, and there's no one else. What a desolation she has become, a lair for wild beasts. And from Nahum 3.19, the prophecy, there is no easing your hurt. Your wound is grievous. All who hear the news about you clap their hands over you, for upon whom has not come your unceasing evil. Joseph Free states that a century ago, such familiar biblical sites as Nineveh, and many other were shapeless mounds, the very identity of which in some cases have been forgotten. George Cameron, the University of Chicago states, if a tourist of today, after all that's been written about the ancient civilizations of Babylon and Assyria, fails to get an accurate conception of what the past was, one can easily imagine that the first travelers crossed and recrossed the land without suspecting that they were close to the historical sites of Babylon and Nineveh. Skeptics claim that Nineveh never existed and was only another myth of the Bible as no historical records existed. Robert C.L. Holmes writes, the fall of the Assyrian Empire, 605, changed the balance of power in the ancient Near East. Assyrian hegemony was now shared by other Mesopotamian kingdoms, including Babylonians, Medes, Egyptians, Lydians, which ensured that relations between these great powers were often tense. This was especially true of the Egyptians and Babylonians who would continue to fight until the Persians conquered both. The great war that led to the Assyrian Empire's destruction also brought new peoples into contact with each other and set the stage for later developments. Greek soldiers were employed by the Egyptians and Assyrians and may have gone back to Greece with new ideas and practices. How this may have affected archaic Greek societies, unclear, but there are many possibilities. And so we'll turn to the conqueror of Assyria, the great empire of Neo-Babylon in our study next week and invite you to be a part of that study. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom, peace.